au produit de lutte contre le Covid-19, c'était le 24 avril 2020, l'accélérateur ACTA était né. Un an plus tard, nous pouvons être collectivement fiers de ce que nous avons accompli, même si beaucoup reste à faire. 11 milliards de dollars ont été mobilisés, 191 pays ont rejoint le mécanisme d'achat groupé des vaccins, appelé COVAX. Les volumes sécurisés permettront d'atteindre la cible que nous nous étions donnée, de couvrir 20% de la population. Je souhaite que nous puissions aller plus loin, en particulier vis-à-vis -vis du continent africain. Plus de 40 millions de doses de vaccins ont déjà été distribuées dans 114 pays. Ces quelques chiffres, ces quelques réalités, ce sont les premières réussites de l'initiative Act A, lancée il y a donc maintenant un an. Mais désormais, il nous faut continuer nos efforts, aller plus vite, plus fort, parce que c'est une guerre de vitesse contre la pandémie. Aujourd'hui, la situation n'est, malgré tous les chiffres que je viens de dire, pas satisfaisante. On a une personne sur six qui a reçu au moins une dose de vaccin en Europe. Nous avons une personne sur cinq qui en a reçu en Amérique du Nord. Et à côté de cela, en Afrique, c'est moins d'une sur cent. C'est inacceptable. Il y a une première réponse très simple, à laquelle tous les États qui ont acheté des produits Covid peuvent avoir recours. Et je voudrais vous dire aujourd'hui solennellement que tous ceux qui ont précommandé des vaccins, beaucoup de vaccins, la France en fait partie, l'Union européenne en fait partie, nous avons une responsabilité à l'égard du reste du monde. Nous le savions, en particulier en Europe, lorsque nous avons signé des contrats d'approvisionnement avec tous les plus grands laboratoires. Une de nos conditions en tant qu'acheteurs était de pouvoir un jour donner ou revendre nos doses. Nous ne voulions pas prendre le risque de priver le reste du monde de ces vaccins si précieux. Maintenant, le temps est venu de partager. Nous avons évidemment une campagne vaccinale à mener dans chacun de nos pays. Nos populations les plus vulnérables sont progressivement couvertes. Et nous allons continuer de recevoir de plus en plus de vaccins. Nous avons largement les moyens d'accélérer notre solidarité qui passe par le don de doses. C'est pourquoi je vous annonce aujourd'hui que la France vient d'envoyer les premières doses destinées à COVAX. Ces doses AstraZeneca s'envolent à l'heure où je vous parle vers l'Afrique de l'Ouest, conformément au mécanisme d'allocation équitable de COVAX. Notre objectif, par ces dons, est de permettre à tous les pays, notamment en Afrique, de vacciner leurs populations les plus commençant d'ailleurs par les personnels de santé. Cet engagement, nous l'avions pris ensemble au G7 en février dernier, et nous le tiendrons d'ici au mois de juin. Bien sûr, nous allons partager de plus en plus de vaccins, au moins 500 000 doses d'ici mi-juin, avec un panier de vaccins de plus en plus diversifié pour répondre aussi aux différents enjeux de la population que COVAX doit servir. L'essentiel dans cet engagement, je crois, est que nous ayons fait le choix de donner à COVAX en effet, l'allocation des vaccins doit être fondée sur des critères objectifs que seule l'Organisation mondiale de la santé, à travers le mécanisme COVAX et le rôle qu'elle y joue, est en capacité de nous donner. C'est pourquoi j'appelle aujourd'hui tous mes confrères, qui sont aussi dans cette situation, à s'engager à partager des doses de vaccins. J'avais évoqué la cible de 5% en février, mais je peux d'ores et déjà vous dire que celle-ci sera dépassée en ce qui nous concerne avant la fin de l'année. Il y a ensuite beaucoup d'autres choses, on le sait bien, que nous devons faire, mais le don de doses est absolument essentiel. Alors en tant qu'État, nous avons beaucoup d'autres choses pour rendre plus concret l'accès de tous aux outils de lutte contre la Covid. Assurer toute la transparence sur les contrats d'approvisionnement afin de lutter contre les pratiques commerciales injustes envers les pays les plus vulnérables. Le système international aujourd'hui est trop opaque. Les critères de livraison, les conditions les dates, les prix. Ensuite, garantir que nous mobilisons toutes les capacités de production de vaccins existantes ou prêtes à être transformées partout dans le monde. Aucun continent ne doit être exclu de la carte de la production. C'est essentiel et cela implique de soutenir les accords de licence et les transferts de technologie. Nous entendons beaucoup parler, en effet, de transfert ou d'absence de propriété intellectuelle. Le sujet, nous le savons aujourd'hui, n'est pas celui-là. C'est celui du transfert de technologie, de la mobilisation des capacités de production. Parce que le goulet d'étranglement est là. Ici, j'appelle très clairement tous les producteurs de vaccins à engager une telle démarche. L'accès global est une responsabilité collective. Les États, les organisations internationales ont un rôle essentiel à jouer. 
et le secteur privé également. Et donc nous devons tous nous engager autour du Medicine Patent Pool pour identifier les capacités de production sous-utilisées pour maximiser et accélérer le transfert de technologie et permettre de produire plus de doses de vaccins utiles. Ensuite, la vaccination est essentielle, mais pour être efficace, elle doit aussi être accompagnée. Elle doit être accompagnée d'abord d'un renforcement de nos capacités de diagnostic et de séquençage afin de suivre et lutter efficacement contre les variants. Je veux ici souligner le travail exceptionnel qui a été fait par la CDC Africa, soutenue par l'AFD, par nos instituts de recherche et le réseau des instituts Pasteur. Ce projet permettra de mieux connaître le profil de la pandémie en Afrique, limiter les risques de mortalité chez les personnes les plus vulnérables et d'orienter les choix d'achat de vaccins. La vaccination doit ensuite être accompagnée d'un véritable mouvement structurel de renforcement des systèmes de santé, qui est la pierre angulaire de toute forme de lutte contre les pandémies. Nous devons en effet nous assurer qu'ils sortent plus forts de cette crise. C'est une priorité centrale à mes yeux et l'Agence française de développement a d'ores et déjà engagé des montants très conséquents, 1,2 milliard d'euros l'an dernier, et nous venons de valider à nouveau 1 milliard d'euros dédiés à aider les systèmes de santé pour lutter contre la Covid. Le sommet du 21 mai de l'Assemblée mondiale de la santé qui suivra permettra justement d'acter tous nos points de rendez-vous sur ces sujets. Nous devrons répondre aux enjeux d'aujourd'hui pour dessiner une sortie de crise collective et solidaire. Nous devrons aussi bâtir sur cette expérience hors du commun toutes les leçons pour repenser l'architecture mondiale de la santé. Celle-ci devra être plus robuste, plus inclusive, sera aussi plus efficace pour faire face aux futures pandémies. Une organisation mondiale de la santé réformée, renforcée, doit en être la pierre angulaire. Beaucoup de choses se jouent aujourd'hui. La crédibilité même du multilatéralisme en matière de santé se joue aujourd'hui dans notre capacité à livrer rapidement des doses sur le terrain, en Amérique latine, Amérique du Sud, en Afrique entre autres, dans le Pacifique également. C'est à nous de faire. Et donc je compte sur chacun d'entre nous, nous serons là. Je vous remercie. Thank you, thank you so much, Your Excellency President Macron. And thank you to you and France for your generous don donation to COVAX. I hope other countries will soon follow your example. The strength of the Act Accelerator is that it has been supported strongly by governments all over the world. Now it's my honor to introduce three leaders who have been unwavering in their support. Prime Minister Mario Draghi of Italy, President Paul Kagame of Rwanda, and President Pedro Sanchez of Spain. Mr. General, dear colleagues, the pandemic has shown us the importance of international collaboration in the realm of public health. Viruses and infectious diseases know no borders. COVID-19 quickly spread from China to the rest of the world and has claimed so far at least 3 million lives globally. Regrettably, our initial response lacked coordination. The global community failed to share information promptly and adequately. We struggled to understand that what was happening to another country would quickly happen to us too. Global threats require global responses. We will not be completely safe until all countries are safe. The ACT Accelerator, born a year ago, is an excellent example of what we can achieve when we work together. It aims to support the development and equitable distribution of the tests treatments and vaccines needed to bring the pandemic under control. It treats global health for what it really is, a public good. This is why since its inception, Italy has been amongst its strongest supporters and main contributors. We now see an end to the worst of this pandemic. Thanks to global cooperation, scientists have developed a number of effective vaccines 
that can save lives and help us return to a normal life. But this success cannot be a source of complacency. We have to be more ambitious. We need to scale up research and development to fight new variants. We need to strengthen our health systems. We need to ensure equitable access to diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines, also in low-income countries. This year, Italy holds the presidency of the G20, Overcoming the pandemic and ensuring a sustainable and resilient recovery are at the heart of our agenda. We have emphasized the role of the accelerator in fostering global immunization according to transparent agreed rules. We want to scale up the capability of the COVAX facility to achieve equitable distribution of safe and effective vaccines. Thank you. Excellencies, WHO Director General Dr. Tedros Adhanom, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to join you in marking this first anniversary of the access to COVID-19 tools accelerator and commend Dr. Tedros and the WHO for leading this important response to the global pandemic. For many developing countries, the ACT accelerator has been the only way to access life-saving COVID-19 testing kits, vaccines, and treatment. As the pandemic continues to evolve, often in an unpredictable manner, much more needs to be done to remove barriers to affordability and equitable distribution. In particular, Africa lags behind in the manufacture of vital products for COVID-19 prevention and management. Efforts are underway to build this capacity, but this requires support across the board to ensure that it's done properly and quickly enough to make a difference in the ongoing pandemic and improve preparedness for the next one. Rwanda remains committed to the goals of the ACT Accelerator. By now, there are lessons to learn in order to make this effort more effective. We will continue to work together with the WHO and other partners to defeat the COVID-19 pandemic. I thank you. Hace un año nacía una iniciativa inédita y necesaria, el ACT Accelerator, destinado a impulsar el acceso a herramientas contra la COVID-19 a través de diagnósticos, terapias o vacunas. La situación era de máxima urgencia. La mayoría de los países europeos estábamos en un confinamiento mayor o menor, en España fue muy estricto, y por aquel entonces el número de fallecidos era, por desgracia, aún muy alto. Un año después tenemos motivos para la esperanza. En un creciente número de países las últimas horas del, del virus están siendo algo menos agresivas gracias a la vacunación que empieza a hacer notar sus efectos eh, positivos. Estamos también mejor organizados, concienciados para hacer frente a los contagios y sabemos que no debemos bajar la guardia. En este camino, en estos 365 días, el ACT Accelerator ha jugado un papel fundamental. En primer lugar, como punto de encuentro para debatir sobre las mejores respuestas para combatir la COVID-19. El ACT eh, ha permitido que, que tanto estados eh, como organizaciones internacionales, ONGs, asociaciones, nos sentemos juntos, sin jerarquías, a afrontar este desafío con la eficacia y la solidaridad como únicas eh, máximas en común. Y ha funcionado. Y en segundo lugar, como mecanismo para recaudar fondos, repartirlos, intentando equilibrar las donaciones entre los pilares que más lo necesitaban y atrayendo también al sector privado y a otro tipo de organizaciones, incluyendo bancos regionales y bancos globales. Y en tercer lugar, 
como acervo de lecciones aprendidas y formas de trabajar juntos de cara al futuro. Con independencia de la duración de la ACT en sí, su lección de eficiencia y agilidad, a mi juicio, es intemporal. España está hoy muy orgullosa de haber eh, coliderado esta iniciativa y de pertenecer a su Facilitation Council. Yeah, thank you uh, so much. And we now we move uh, to uh, the UN. As you know, WHO is proud uh, to play a role in ACT Accelerator, but we have only done so as part of the United Nations and with its support. It's now my honor to introduce Amina Mohammed, the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. Director General, Dr. Tedros, my brother, excellencies, distinguished guests, the ACT Accelerator has been a critical multilateral instrument in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. It is saving lives, it is enabling societies and economies to begin the job of recovery, and it is giving us hope. As we mark the ACT Accelerator's first anniversary, it is sobering to look back at the devastating impact of this crisis. COVID-19 has taken more than 3 million lives, it has infected more than 140 million people all over the world, and the virus continues to rage. The pandemic has revealed stark, wide-ranging global fragilities and disparities, including in access to COVID-19 tools, treatments, and vaccines. If we are to successfully combat the pandemic and halt its impact on health and economies, greater global solidarity is crucial. We need coordinated investments in research and development, stepped up production and widespread deployment of effective vaccines, diagnostics and treatments to all regions and countries. That is why the ACT Accelerator was created. One year on, we see its positive impact. This extraordinary partnership has delivered through COVAX more than 40 million doses of life-saving vaccines to 118 participants since its first international delivery to Ghana in February this year. It also secured millions of treatment courses and diagnostic kits for low and middle income countries. Yet vast challenges remain. Vaccine nationalism is hindering COVAX access, slowing distribution of vaccines to the poorest and the most vulnerable. We have seen an unprecedented mobilization of resources for multiple donors, which has raised $14.1 billion for the ACT Accelerator. Yet $19 billion is still needed to fully finance it for 2021. I call on countries to join this effort and to fully fund the ACT Accelerator. The ACT Accelerator cannot fulfill its mandate without the support of all countries. Let's also recognize that a full and truly sustainable recovery also requires us to get on track to reach the Sustainable Development Goals and achieve universal health coverage. The entire United Nations system has mobilized in support of governments around the world for a response and recovery. We are committed to working together with all partners to make the ACT Accelerator a success for all people. Thank you. Thank you. As I said earlier, the strength of the ACT Accelerator is its wide support from governments all over the world. I'm now pleased to introduce video messages that have been sent by Gail Smith, the global COVID-19 coordinator from the United States of America, Karina Gold, the Minister of International Development of Canada, and Mikhail Murashko, the Minister of Health of the Russian Federation. <clears throat> Greetings. I'm so honored to be here today with heads of state, esteemed guests, partners, and most importantly, the founders of ACT Day. On behalf of President Biden, we congratulate you on this important day, your one year anniversary. Our message to you is one of thanks. Thank you for coming together to build a platform that is enabling us to build a global response to this global pandemic. 
We are strong partners of ACT A and intend to continue to be your partners. Expressed not only in the substantial financial contributions we've been able to make recently, but also as we gather the learnings from this first year and based on the facts, the evidence and the data, increase our impact and effectiveness. Partners, as we champion the cause of global public health and build a world where every country can prevent, detect, and respond to these kinds of global health threats. Partners, as we reach out to other donors and enlist them in this fight. So from all of us on this day, our congratulations and our thanks. You have a partner in the United States. Thank you. Il y a de cela un an, nous avons dû affronter un virus qui ne respecte aucune frontière et qui a entraîné le monde dans une crise sans précédent. Tous les pays avaient besoin de tests, de traitements et de vaccins contre la COVID-19. Tous les pays devaient protéger leurs citoyens et freiner la propagation du virus. Tous les pays devaient arrêter l'émergence de nouveaux variants pour favoriser la reprise mondiale. Our health at home depends on the health of everyone, everywhere. That is why Canada has been committed to the ACT Accelerator from the start. Because the success of Act Day is our best exit strategy from this pandemic. This unprecedented global collaboration has made remarkable progress, with WHO approved vaccines reaching more than 100 countries in less than a year's time with rapid test kits rolled out around the world, and with therapies old and new saving lives and reducing suffering. This is monumental success. It is multilateralism at its best, rising to the global challenge. But now is not the time to let up our efforts. We must bring this response to scale and do so across each act pillar. This will ensure truly global access to safe and effective vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics while strengthening the health systems to deliver them. Together, we need to reach every country. We need to support fragile health systems so vaccines get into people's arms because as the saying goes, it's not vaccines that save people, it's vaccinations. We need to ensure this response reaches every person especially the most vulnerable at risk of being left behind. I am proud to represent Canada on the ACT Accelerator Facilitation Council and to serve as co-chair of the COVAX AMC Engagement Group. I am proud that Canada has committed $940 million to this collaboration and more than $3 billion to the overall response. But so much more is needed and Canada will play its part. Le moment est venu de nous mobiliser et d'appuyer les remarquables organisations partenaires de l'accélérateur ACT. Chacun doit faire sa juste part dans cet effort mondial. All countries, all stakeholders, everyone. It is the only way we can defeat this pandemic. We must act now and we must act together. Уважаемый господин председатель, уважаемые коллеги, прошел год со дня учреждения инициативы по ускорению доступа к инструментам борьбы с COVID-19. И мы можем с уверенностью отметить, что Act A стал глобальной межотраслевой инициативой, которая способствовала укреплению взаимодействия стран мира и международных организаций в усилиях по созданию, производству и справедливому распределению тест-систем, лекарственных препаратов и вакцин. Поздравляю всех участников инициативы с достигнутыми результатами. Мы приветствуем работу механизма COVAX, в рамках которого начались долгожданные поставки вакцин против COVID-19 в страны со средним и низким уровнем дохода. Надеемся, что наша главная цель – обеспечение равноправного глобального доступа к вакцинам – будет достигнута в ближайшее время. Выражаем готовность расширять наше взаимодействие с инициативой Act A, ВОЗ и другими международными платформами для достижения поставленных целей. 
Россия в это сложное время остается верной обещанием, данным на площадке группы 20 Всемирной организации здравоохранения и продолжает вносить вклад в глобальные усилия по борьбе с пандемией. Мы координируем многосторонние усилия по борьбе с пандемией в рамках сотрудничества БРИКС, ШОС, СНГ. На двухсторонней основе мы осуществили регистрацию вакцины «Спутник Ви» в более чем в 60 странах мира. Поставляем и локализуем производство вакцины в зарубежных странах. Провели кампанию по вакцинации дипломатического состава зарубежных представительств, расположенных в городе Москве и направили соответствующие добровольные взносы в целый ряд агентств Организации Объединенных Наций. Уважаемые коллеги, переломить ситуацию с пандемией новой коронавирусной инфекции возможно только совместными усилиями. Мы желаем инициативе Act A дальнейшего укрепления и успешного функционирования во благо всего мира. Thank you. Thank you so much. And civil society organizations play a vital role in every, health, in every area of health, holding leaders to account, providing technical expertise, delivering services, and giving voice to their communities. The ACT Accelerator is no exception. And it's now my honor to introduce Peter Ngola Owiti from, from Kenya, who is a civil society representative on the ACT Accelerator Facilitation Council. Dear colleagues, one year ago, we came together to form Access to COVID Tools Accelerator. But much more still needs to be done. To avoid more deaths, excess vaccines must be donated or sold to low- and middle-income countries. Vaccine manufacturing facilities should be accelerated in Rwanda, Senegal, and the Republic of South Africa. Rapid antigen tests must be provided for broad use in low- and middle-income countries, the same way that the Global North is using them. There is urgent need to tackle the oxygen crisis, particularly in India and Africa. Civil societies and communities should be supported and provided with enabling environment to meaningfully respond to the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics would not exist at all without the private sector companies who develop and produce them. It's now my pleasure to welcome Thomas Cooney, the Director General of the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association, to be followed by John Denton, the Secretary General of the International Chamber of Commerce. In joining ACT Day last year, the biopharmaceutical industry signed up to bring to this partnership a unique expertise in the discovery, development, and large scale manufacturing of medicines and vaccines. A year later, we can say science wins. Not one, but several highly effective vaccines have been developed at record speed and are now produced in historic quantities. As partners of ACT Day, we committed to accelerate global access to safe, effective, and affordable COVID-19 treatments and vaccines. To make this happen, we are seeing unprecedented partnerships between vaccine manufacturers from developing and industrialized countries. Yes, we have had setbacks. Some vaccine projects failed bumps and hitches in scaling up manufacturing, and we know the world needs to do better in walking to talk on vaccine equity. However, we are still witnessing the fastest vaccine rollout ever. To end the pandemic, we must continue this journey together. Good day. My name is John Denton. I'm the Secretary General of the International Chamber of Commerce the institutional representative of 45 million businesses worldwide. At the ICC, we have supported the ACT, or ACT Accelerator, since its inception as only a truly global, inclusive and collaborative response will stop the spread of COVID and minimise its economic damage. Not only is that the right thing to do, it's also the smart thing to do. The longer it takes for us to control COVID everywhere, 
the greater the suffering and lives lost. Businesses shuttered, societies frayed, and nations divided. We have shown that the economic cost alone of vaccine nationalism, of failing to quickly distribute vaccines to all countries, no matter how rich they are, could amount to up to $9 trillion. Yes, that's right, $9 trillion. And the longer we wait to find the remaining $25 billion or so for the ACT Accelerator, the more these costs will grow. That is why we at the ICC believe the ACT Accelerator remains, on its first birthday, not only great health policy, but also the best possible jab in the arm for the global economy. With high effectiveness, zero side effects, and even potential to stop the spread of protectionist policies that would hamper a much needed economic recovery. Vaccine early, vaccine and accelerate. And accelerate. Thank you so much to all our speakers today. As I said in my opening remarks, the ACT Accelerator is a unique partnership that has involved the participation of nine global health organizations, working together to build something that's truly much more than the sum of its parts. Today, I'm delighted to welcome the leaders of each of our partners, Seth Berkeley from Gavi, Philip Denton from UnitAid, Chris Elias from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Henrietta Four from UNICEF, Emma Hane from FIND, Richard Hatchett from SEPI, Mohamed Pate from the World Bank, Peter Sands from the Global Fund, and Carl Bild, our special envoy for the ACT Accelerator and co-chair of the group and the former Prime Minister of Sweden. Thank you all. Thank you all of you for your leadership and partnership, and I look forward to our continued collaboration in the months ahead as we work together to stop infections, save lives, and end the pandemic. Christian, back to you. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Tedros. Happy birthday, ACT Accelerator. Um, before we head into the question and answer session um, with these ACT principles and leads as just introduced. We'll show you a quick clip on the 12 months of the ACT Accelerator. See you in a moment. One year ago, world leaders launched a global solution to rapidly end the pandemic and equip countries to fight this devastating virus. The ACT Accelerator has secured more than 60 million COVID-19 tests, over $500 million worth of equipment to keep health workers safe, and nearly 3 million doses of the proven COVID-19 treatment, dexamethasone. COVAX has delivered more than 40 million vaccines to over 100 countries and economies, and ACT Accelerator-supported research continues to find the next generation of tools. But the pandemic isn't over. Societies and economies are still suffering. Our safety and security is still at risk. And history is still in the making. It's time to recommit to act together. Let's take research, production, and distribution up a gear to keep everyone, everywhere, safe from COVID-19. Welcome back. Let me now open the floor to questions from the media. To get into the queue, please, uh, for to ask questions, please raise your hand with the raise your hand icon on your screen. Yeah. Um, and we would be happy, of course, to get as many questions for our special guests. We'll start with the first on my screen, and that's Jamie Keaton from Associated Press. Jamie? Oh, I'm very sorry, wrong here. This is uh, Jamil Shad from Progresso. Jamil, please unmute yourself. Yes, hello, Christian. Um, is the President Cyril Ramaphosa still uh, available for questions? No, I'm afraid not. Uh, we'll have the uh, principles available as just briefly introduced by Dr. Tedros. Sure. Um, then uh, uh, my question is to Dr. Tedros, basically. Um, if he allows, 
you have called this an outrage, the fact that it was not distributed as fast as, uh, as um, uh, it was envisaged. Uh, do you think that it has been enough what we have seen, or is it still long to go? And also this week you had a meeting with the new foreign minister of Brazil. What was your message to him? Thank you, sir. We'll start with, the, with Dr. Aylward for the first part. Seth. Seth oh, Seth Beckley, so, sorry. <laughs> Dr. Berkeley, great if you could start with the first part. Dr. Seth Berkeley from the Gavi Vaccine Alliance, please. Well, well, thank you for the question. Of course, the answer is, um, um, although we are very excited, as you've heard, that we've started delivering now to 118 countries, more than 40 million doses, um, and also we've seen the millions of tests and diagnostics secured, this is not enough. And um, we have to do much more. We need to um, have uh, the global supply to increase um, dramatically. This is going to require another paradigm shift to more manufacturing, including further voluntary tech transfers to boost production, particularly in and for emerging economies. We've heard that now theme multiple times. And we need more countries to donate vaccines because um, there is a limit to how many one can purchase on the open market. Um, we, we really were very happy to and want to thank President Macron for his leadership with today's announcement of France donating uh, to COVAX to be distributed equitably to lower income countries where they're needed most. I warmly welcome that. And, and um, really feel that, um, you know, hopefully we'll hear from other leaders uh, similar action and urge them to do so. And I would just say that, um, you know, we also heard the important point with the virus raging out of control in parts of the world and more and more new variants appearing, collective action and commitment to equity remains our only hope for the pandemic to end. So um, we're only safe if everyone is safe. And I want to, since this is the first time I'm speaking, I want to say happy birthday to my dear colleagues. So a longer answer to the answer, no, not enough. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Berkeley and Dr. Aylward, uh, please. Thank you very much, Christian and Jamil. Thank you for the question. We had an excellent conversation with the, uh, His Excellency, the Foreign Minister of Brazil, earlier this week. Um, appreciated everything that was being done now to step up the response, ensure the right measures are in place to slow down the crisis there. We spoke also about the important work being done in Brazil to escalate the production of vaccines, some of the challenges they were facing inside the country, and uh, how we might be able to help in terms of ensuring the continued supply of raw materials and other materials that were needed. In the course of that, we appreciated as well the commitment from the foreign minister and the government of Brazil to not only be escalating production for Brazil, but they were also looking um, forward beyond the crisis uh, currently faced in the country to how they might help uh, the rest of the world as well with vaccines as they scale production, reach their own populations, are able to do more. And then finally, the role of COVAX was appreciated, and especially the work that's ongoing to escalate deliveries to all countries, um, especially those hard hit like Brazil, as we go forward. Thank you very much, Dr. Elwood. And we'll come to Pretty Patnaik from Geneva. Pretty, please unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Um, this is a question for, for Dr. Tidros or Dr. Mike Ryan. Um, you've often said that WHO cannot criticize member states in public. But we are wondering if you will make a statement on the elections, political rallies, and religious gatherings um, in the midst of the surge in India, um, and whether WHO had praised India a bit too soon. And as a consequence, what is the plan B for COVAX in the context of the Indian challenges? Thank you. Thank you very much, Priti. And I'll look at Dr. Mike Ryan, who also joined us. Uh, the Executive Director for WHO's Health Emergencies Program. Dr. Ryan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yes, and uh, Sumi Swamanatha may be in line as well. They wish to make a comment. We've been in very close contact with our regional office and our country office in supporting India in what is a very complex uh, situation there. 
This is not easy for anyone who have a uh, disease that has rapidly spread. Multiple factors have driven that uh, acceleration in cases. It is a very difficult task both to reduce the force of infection by having um, people adapt to behavior. Not always easy in the situations that people find themselves in in India, but we've got to reduce mobility. We've got to reduce mixing in whatever way we can to reduce the force of infection. The Indian government are moving to do that. Uh, there's been a huge focus on increasing uh, COVID management and triage, and uh, the Indian government has been scaling up oxygen production, working very, very closely with uh, UNDP and UNICEF and others, and we've offered help and assistance in clinical management and triage and in, in, in scaling up oxygen supplies as, as needed. Um, the, uh, India is a very, as you know, large, populous country, complex, different situations, different epidemiologic situations in different states. Unfortunately, we lost Dr. Ryan there. Yeah. Managing uh, public health threats. Dr. Ryan, we lost you for a moment. Please come back if there's more. Okay. Um, Hold on for a second. Quick technical issue. Can we try again? Yes, please, Dr. Ryan. Hello? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, Christian, where did you lose me? Um, I think when he spoke about Complex oxygen. Complex issue, multiple states. Yeah, just as he started with the oxygen, correct, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm just recognizing the role that our colleagues, uh, sister agencies, UNDP and UNICEF, have played in supporting oxygen uh, scale-up in India. But the Indian government are moving very fast to scale-up oxygen supply. We're providing technical assistance and clinical management and triaging of patients. That's really key now. We've got to save lives. We've got to have rational use of these measures, not hoarding. The patients who need oxygen, the patients who need uh, clinical care need to get it. Uh, there's a lot of fear in, in India right now, and, and the government are trying to bring calm, they're trying to bring an orderly approach. The states are doing the same. The situation is not the same in all the states. Some states are facing a much more serious situation than others. So we support the government of India, like we support all governments in, fa in, 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 in facing this really, really difficult situation. It is difficult. It is not the time for recriminations. It's the time for solidarity. It's the time to move quickly together to reduce deaths, to reduce transmission by decreasing mobility and mixing, by supporting communities and mask wearing and where they can in, in, in maintaining social uh, distance and in reducing the amount of gatherings that are occurring that are driving transmission as well. This is not easy in the context of India. It's not easy in the context of any state, especially one as populous as India. So I think this is the time to show solidarity and support for what the Indian government are trying to achieve. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ryan. And I believe Dr. Berkeley might have something to add, Seth, from the Gavi Alliance. Um, yes, I, I will. I, I will just say that um, we, of course, have been uh, working closely with India on vaccine provision. The first 10 million doses of, of uh, from COVAX went um, to India. Uh, we've supported the scale up of multiple vaccines now that are uh, that are being produced in India. Of course, it is a very difficult time. And one of the challenges we've had to try to work with is how one balances the acute needs for India, where there's a very large population, but the needs for many other countries that rely on India as uh, one of the vaccine manufacturers for the world. And that's something that we've been trying to balance working with the manufacturers there and the government there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Berkeley. We'll move to the next question, and that's uh, Abdallah Wassan from Morocco. Abdallah, please unmute yourself. Marhaban. أشكركم على اختيار سؤالي هذا والسؤال كالتالي ما هي نسبة استفادة المغرب من آليات كوفاكس ومن صندوق الاستجابة للتضامن لحد الآن ما هو توقع توقع المنظمة العالمية للصحة تلقي تلقيح الكلي والشامل للسكان في البلدان المصرية الداخل شكرا Thank you very much, Abdullah. I think we just uh, heard the rest of the translation. Um, could I ask Seth Berkeley again from the Vaccine Alliance, please? Thank you, 
So um, thank you for that um, question. Um, uh, of course, um, Morocco is part of uh, the COVAX effort and is um, supported as one of the advanced market commitment countries. And, and so it will be receiving doses as, as part of that. Um, in terms of its numbers, um, the numbers that it is expected to receive um, have been posted on our website. Um, there is a slight delay in um, the supplies from the manufacturer that Morocco is, is receiving, um, but those will be uh, coming in the next few months. And for Dr. Elwood to add, please. Yeah, and just in terms of the number of the amount that's, uh, that's already scheduled, um, over a third of that, about 300,000 doses, have already been shipped out. Uh, and again, as, as Seth said, hoping to accelerate the rest of that over the next two months. Thank you for these clarifications. We'll move on to Jeremy Lange from RFE. Jeremy, please, please unmute yourself. Thank you, Christian. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Thanks. Uh, I, I just wanted to have a, a few, the latest information about the the CTAP and the um, MPP um, uh, disposal of uh, WHO. Uh, is any manufacturer uh, uh, actually uh, joined uh, the, the CTAP and the MPP so far? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremy. We'll give this to Dr. Simao, Mariangela Simao, if online. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremy. We do have, a, we are in negotiations with four manufacturers for diagnostics, and this is on an ongoing process. So far, we have approached different manufacturers for vaccines and also the, the potential manufacturers for uh, uh, small molecules, uh, the pharmaceuticals, but have not been successful in that extent as well. But let me, I think we have the colleague from the, the director from the medicines patent pool, and he can give a, a, an overview from the medicines patent pool itself, because I believe they, they have some news on their side. It's Charles Gore online. Yes, I am. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sumir, and thank you for the question. Uh, just like to say that uh, to um, restate what Sum Dr. Sumia said that uh, at the moment we have we're not in a position to uh, actually get a license, but we are in discussions with a, a number of uh, a number of com uh, companies. But what is important, I think, is what uh, President Macron said that we really need to encourage more companies to come forward to enter into discussions to see how we could uh, help in the response to um, COVID. Because, as you know, the medicines patent pool was set up for another health emergency, HIV, and that allowed us to uh, address that by increasing the number of manufacturers across the world through transparent licensing and non-exclusive licenses that allowed a very broad geographic manufacturing base, things that we need for COVID. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this was uh, Charles Gore from the Medicines Patent Pool, MPP. And before we had Dr. Mariangela Simao, Assistant Director General for, for Access to Medicines and Health Products at WHO. Next question goes to John Saracostas from The Lancet. John, please unmute yourself. Yes, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Very well. Please go ahead. Yes, yes. Uh, I was wondering, uh, going forward, uh, if uh, some of the experts uh, on the panel have any out-of-the-box ideas on how to really ramp up global vaccine production. There have been some successful models in history, like in World War II, with the penicillin production, where the cooperation between the US government and pharmaceutical companies managed to produce up to 650 billion units per month. So is there a chance for a new model? Thank you very much, John. I'd like to start with Dr. Richard Hatchett from SIPI, and possibly followed by Dr. Henry the Four, uh, Ms. Henrietta Four from UNICEF. So Dr. Hatchett, please.
please unmute yourself, Dr. Hatchett. Sorry, Dr. Hatcher, we have no sound right now. Let me try start with Ms. Four from UNICEF, um, Executive Director first, and otherwise we try you again. Sorry. Ms. Four, please. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry. I'm responding to an earlier question, <clears throat> which came from the gentleman from Morocco, <clears throat> on what we are doing to help other countries. So I just wanted to mention that as an alliance, um, cold chain in country, so solar powered refrigerators, the training of healthcare workers, the help in getting uh, um, vaccines out into the countryside by every possible means, and to get the community workers to carry a sense of trust so that people feel good about getting a vaccination and that vaccines move from the tarmac into the arms of the people who need it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Four, and we'll try again uh, for Dr. Hatchett from SIPI if we have a better sound now. Oh dear, unfortunately not. Um, very sorry for that, Dr. Hatchett, and for all who can't hear this now, we'll possibly try it again Chris, later. Do you, want me to, oh, do you want me to say something? It's set. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. We do need a spectacular increase in volume of production. The world produces somewhere around four to five billion doses, and what we're talking about is a tripling or quadrupling of production. The first priority, which I know Richard would have talked about, is right now we're seeing supply constraints, and that is stopping vaccine production right now. For example, we know of one company that has over 20,000 liters of production capacity, but they have not been able to produce vaccines because they don't have the raw materials and equipment they need to do that. The second thing that's critical is making sure that everybody who has the ability to produce vaccine is part of this. And CEPI is, as part of the COVAX Manufacturing Task Force, reaching out to all manufacturers on the world now to relook at what the capacity is now. They did this a year ago, but things have changed so much to see are there additional places to go. And the last issue will be, of course, trying to uh, move into new capacity development. Of course, that takes more time, but there is an active discussion um, on, on how that might be done to move forward. So it is a very important part of what we do. Of course, we don't know, will we need boosters because of waning immunity? Will we need new vaccines because of variants? Will we need boosters for variants? So regardless of any of those three issues, we will need more vaccines. So. Um, uh, we're all looking, working together to try to see how we can get there as quickly as possible. Over. Thank you very much. And this was Dr. Seth Berkeley from the Gavi Vaccine Alliance. Um, Dr. Emma Hennay from FIND wanted to add on the diagnostics. Dr. Hennay, please. Uh, no, there was nothing else from, from my end to add on those questions so far. Sorry for the misunderstanding, and um, I'm asking um, Dr. Philip Dunton from Unitaid uh, if he wanted to ask. No, I don't see anything. Then we move on to the next question. Um,